Okay, I'm not going to say very much. I'm just going to encourage you to, to have a seat. I'm going to welcome the people that are joining us online. Um, and I'm going to hand over to this amazing team of people, um, led and supported by the wonderful Prince Taylor, who was one of the very first people to get involved with Bristol and Bath Creative R&D, actually, as one of our digital placemaking fellows on the very first bit of the program. So what a wonderful way to end two wonderful days and an amazing project. Um, Prince will introduce his panel, um, so I'll hand over to him. Thank you, thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you everyone for coming through uh, and joining us on this, yeah, last panel of what's been an active two days. Um, my name is Prince, Prince Taylor. I am a, sorry, I'm a man of African diaspora heritage in his early 30s. I'm a healthy 80 kilograms at the minute, which I'm, <laughs> I'm chuffed about. Uh, if you know, you know why. Uh, I'm wearing a festive green hat, holding a festive red microphone, wearing a white t-shirt, um, light blue jeans, and yeah, I'm just stoked to be here. Um, I'm joined by the incredible Anna, the marvelous Tim, the wonderful Naomi, and the fantastic Beryl. Um, I'm going to give you all a chance to introduce yourselves to our listeners in the, in the room and at home as well. Who wants to go first? I'm gonna, let's play. I'll go first. Thank you. But it's uh, James. James not yes, James, not, not Tim, Tim innit? We worked hard on the name. Yeah, we did. Uh, I was drawing myself. I imagine Boris Beck has let himself go. Um, <laughs> I reckon uh, that's about as good as it gets. No, I uh, used to have flocks of ginger hair now, just very, very little grey hair left. Um, so my name's James Benz. I've been in Bristol and Bath Media for about 30 years and uh, currently running a business in Bath called Network N. We're a games, movies, media business, about 150 people. Uh, I joined the, the Pathfinder program, uh, Amplified Publishing. I've got prototype funding for a thing called Follower that is constantly being worked on and uh, very happy to be here. Thank you, James. <laughs> uh, who wants to go next? Should I pick somebody? I'm going to go for you, Naomi, because of the green. Okay. Um, hello. Uh, I'm Naomi Smythe. I'm in my early 40s and um, white with short black hair and uh, sort of brown dyed. used to be rainbow. Um, and um, a green cardigan, the same color as Prince's beanie. We arranged it in advance. Um, and I am a PhD student with, um, at Bath Spa University, and I'm looking at remote liveness um, and how mainly immersive theatre artists, but also, um, yeah, theatre artists generally use technology to kind of connect with the audience during COVID and kind of what's, what's happening with that sort of surge and experimentation now. And I'm kind of from an immersive theatre um, and... Uh, videography background, sort of combination of the two as a practitioner. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, Beryl? Hi. Um, so my name is Beryl Dumble, and I am um, of African descent, uh, black hair, with some cute little pom-poms, um, wearing double denim, working our way up to triple denim at the moment. There will be a day. Um, and I work in arts marketing, so an arts marketing consultant. Um, yeah, arts culture, sort of my favorite things to sort of work on at the moment. But. Thank you, Bill. And Anna? Hi, my name is Anna. Is that actually on? Yep. Okay. Uh, my name is Anna Livrodashka. I am Bulgarian, which is where my accent is from. I am a research associate at the University of Bath. I'm working in a very exciting team with Professor Dana Stanton Fraser, Professor of uh, Human Computer Interaction, and Professor Ian Gilchrist, um, who is a neuropsychologist. And so together, we're kind of very excited about trying to measure people's inner states. Um, and specifically, in the context of audience research, we're looking at a particular state, which is immersion, which is the point where, I don't know if you've experienced it, when you, when you experience art, there is a moment when everything else just disappears and it's just you and the content and that's sort of 
your sense of self and time just sort of strips away and it's this weird timeless space and it's very it's thing we feel around art and we're looking for ways to measure it thank you Anna. that description is incredible man you just gave me loads of memories of times when that's happened for me as well um yeah so uh, we are here with you today and we're going to be talking about audience and audience interaction and everything that sort of comes along with that. Um, FYI, I know nothing about what we're going to be talking about today, um, apart from the fact that I've experienced what Anna just mentioned. Um, my, as Joe mentioned, my involvement in the Creative Cluster program was being a research fellow on the Digital Placemaking Pathfinder. And um, we had that very exciting process of like designing research and then being about to launch the research and the world going into lockdown, uh, which meant that everything we'd sort of designed had to be reconfigured and rejigged, um, which has made sort of like the entire journey and, and uh, sort of like distance with which we've interacted with the program beyond our fellowship. Um, very random, I guess, between all of the research fellows. Uh, but one thing we do know is that sort of um, the, I guess, like pride, passion, and interest that all of us have had for all of the other um, um, pathfinders and other projects that have come out of the program as well. It's been incredibly exciting to hear of that stuff um, and watch it develop and to keep learning more, actually. Um, when I was researching you guys, I was just like, oh Lord, yeah, I'm out of my depth, so I'm gonna enjoy this. Um, the way this works is I'm gonna try my best to try and model, I guess, what my idea of audience interaction is. Uh, so I've been working really closely with my tech Don Ewan, um, who is going to ping something up on the screen for us right now, bang, bang, look at that, magic. Um, for those who are in the room and for those who are watching from home as well, if you head to slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O.com, um, and scan the QR code if you can, or enter the code at the bottom, which is 26423111, you can participate in this interview. I'm effectively getting you to do my job for me. Love it. Um, so as a group, um, sort of I did my best to create a collection of questions that I thought would, I don't know, like get us thinking and get us really, I guess for ourselves, immersed in the conversation about audience and audience participation. Um, and fortunately for me, the group were really happy with the questions that I designed and sent over. So I guess at this point, it is up to you as the audience to pick which questions our esteemed panelists are going to answer. I am going to give you, I did forget something, I forgot a theme tune for the countdown. Um, I'm going to give you a minute or so to cast your votes. I'm gonna ask you a question as well. How do you want this to happen? Do you want them to be able to see what's happening or should they just stay looking forward? How do we feel? <laughs> Hands up if you feel like they should be allowed to look behind them. Ha <laughs> ha, there you go, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so you pick one and it should, and then pick one and press send. Yeah. Yeah. Can we really not look? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, in, in terms of like my ability to be an umpire, I'm kind of soft. <laughs> so, you made us prepare four questions for each category. <laughs> so, four times five, we have 20 answers we have to work on. Yeah, that's preparation, yeah, soft, man. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> luck is when preparation meets opportunity, man. So, one, one of you is going to get lucky three times, basically. Oh, who did that? <laughs> who? Uh... Oh, wow. There's a lot happening, man. It's getting wild. So, okay. Okay. Cool. That, that is my, uh, I guess, like, minute in, in my mind, in my body. Um, so we're going to go for the top question, naturally. Um, and I'm going to ask our panelists, is it? possible to recreate, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Okay, cool. Yeah? Uh, what happens to an experience once the novelty wears off? Uh, I'm going to come straight to you, Anna, with that one. Right, that's nice. I really like this question, by the way. Uh, for me, I think, as a psychologist, there's something really exciting about things that are timeless and universal. So to me, I think what happens when the novelty wears off is we need those things that are timeless, narratives. Like, we just, as human beings, we love stories. That seems to, as of yet, not worn off. Um, and I think that's just quite exciting. And we see it with, I suppose, new media, um, that there's something universal across. There's certain things that, for example, you could do in VR when VR is new, let's say. And you can get away with not having for example, a story, because that's just people are really excited to see anything in a kind of immersive 3D environment. Um, and what we see afterwards is that as people become accustomed to the memory, the, the medium alone is not sufficient to hold attention. Um, and that's what we see now. So for example, with, with VR, we tend to see this trend now that it's not just about the visuals, but for example, stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah I love that. Uh about stories, man. That's that's what keeps everything fresh. Uh, like, in as I understand it, anyway. Um, like Naomi, when um, I was doing some research into sort of like your involvement in the classes program as well, I came across um, a film you made, uh, which is The Invisible Circus. Yeah. Yeah. So Invisible Circus, no dress rehearsal, which yeah. is like on, it's on YouTube now. If anyone wants to see that. Yeah, yeah, which which was in, incredible, actually. Like, it really captured, for me, sort of um, the essence of this part of the country, uh, this this part of the world specifically as well, I guess, in that um, Bristol's known for that real, like, DIY, do-it-yourself, uh, almost that uh, by any means necessary type of um, drive, too, as well. Um, it'd be great to sort of hear a little bit about I guess how you have kept that, the novelty of that through your work as you've gone on to do like PhDs as well and that sort of like rebellious element of your work too. Thank you, yeah. Um, so that period of time that where I was filming 2006 to 2011 was just before uh, squatting came illegal. Um, so the Invisible Circus, who I was following at the time, I started out filming them in squats. Um, and so kind of just as after I released the film, squatting became illegal. And so those sort of big art squats, uh, I kind of, they, they already had transitioned into more working with developers on meanwhile spaces and, and uh, taking over temporarily empty things and sort of giving back the keys when they were asked. Um, that sort of ad hoc, grab what you have, grab what you can afford, um, use what's to hand, definitely was my training ground and, um, and sort of creating immersive experiences on very low budgets um, in person. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess during my PhD kind of COVID hit in the new year after I started. And I thought I'd be working with in-person immersive theatre, but, um, but then that was like even more dangerous than normal theatre to be all touching the same props and talking to performers up close. So um, yeah, I was quite, um, in retrospect, I was quite excited by a kind of return to like grab it, like, doing what you can with like what's around you and kind of watching what what people were doing in these really like hard circumstances mm. in a medium that's about gathering people in space you know um, so yeah that's kind of animated the practice I did and also um, the the research also mm. yeah yeah amazing like um one of one of the things that I sort of understand, I guess, uh, when it comes to sort of like audience participation, is the it's the journey into that timeless moment 
I guess. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it, it takes a moment to get there, and then once you're there, you kind of forgot, forget that you went on that journey to get there, and the only memory you really have is of this incredible moment where everything else, like you said, just um, falls away. Um, so I was just wondering, I guess, like, James and the, and the work that you've been doing, when it, when it comes to designing experiences for audiences, is that sort of like a conscious thought for you? Are you thinking, oh, I want to give them, you're only thinking about the best experience ever, or are you thinking about sort of like how to capture as wide an audience in that as possible? Um, I've got an answer for that, and I've got an answer to the broader question as well. Um, nice. You need to design things with the audience in mind. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about where the novelty wears off, right, there are, there are th three factors I've got in my head. One is the novelty wears off for the creator, actually. <laughs> and, um, and that's the creator's problem, uh, not the audience's problem. And the creator sometimes needs to sort of dig what they do or change. But it, just because it's boring for them doesn't mean they shouldn't carry on. Uh, in movies and games, we see sequels, and they make a ton of money. So I, I think there's no shame in carrying on with the thing, first of all. all right? The second thing is, the novelty wears off for some of the people you have reached with your art. Right? Mm -hmm. And that is not all the people. Uh, and for everything you make, there are millions of people that will be into the thing you've made. And there's a shame in marketing and distribution mechanics, because everyone wants to just be a creator, but in fact, the opportunity for work to reach such a bigger audience uh, is always there baked in because the way that uh, tribes work now, on digital particularly, you can find a bigger audience for the thing for whom the novelty hasn't worn off because they haven't seen it yet. And the final thing is uh, the novelty is wearing off the technology quicker than you hope because VR today isn't good enough. So you know, people are, accept the idea of theatre and they go, right, I understand that, and they accept the idea of television, and uh, music concerts, but the belief of what you're going to get with VR versus the reality, the novelty wears off because, because it's not delivering on what you think rather than because the novelty, it's not novel. I think it's just a failure of the medium. Mm. Yeah. Hey, bars, absolute bars, man. <laughs> so <laughs> um, that, you just reminded me of, uh, a film I watched like many moons ago. Um, two of them actually, both Sylvester Stallone films, I'm sorry. Uh, Judge Dredd and Demolition Man. And like, sort of like, <laughs> yep. The perspective of the world that both of those films sort of created and generated and um, how they had imagined uh, tech and society so it sort of be working in harmony, but also in conflict as well. Let's talk about Judge Dredd, Prince. You know, Judge Dredd began life in 1977 in issue two of 2000 AD. It's on the old IP, mm -hmm. right? And they had that Stallone movie, and then Alex Garland wrote and directed another one, which was much better than the Judge Dredd movie. It might come to Netflix, who knows? You know, these, these IPs can have longevity. And it's not about um, people getting bored of the novelty. It's uh, refresh it and keep going. Mm -hmm. I think that's Judge Dredd. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and then you also mentioned sort of like marketing as well and, and the loads of different opportunities that are available to us now because of the internet and, and the digital sphere as well. And I guess like uh, Beryl, you mentioned that that's, that's your field of work at the minute. Um, so sort of like what comes to mind for you if you're thinking about sort of presenting something that's novel to specifically to an audience that you, I guess, know aren't usually able to experience that type of tech or that, that experience in themselves, it, be it for finance, be it for accessibility, do you know what I mean? Like, what kind of comes to mind for you in terms of bringing a new audience into a space like that? Just the small questions, Will, right? <laughs> Just the small <laughs> I can't um, help it, man. I guess what, what comes to mind for me is, I guess in marketing there's an idea of something that's familiar to the audience. So then it's always having, using the same imagery to a certain extent, but then you have to know that at some point people clock off and they don't 
watch it or they don't pay attention to it. So question being, on your walk here, I don't even know how many ads that you saw, actually, probably thousands, but how do you remember that? But then when you see it for the second time, the third time, maybe then that appeals to you. Um, but then also what happens when you're just using, you need to find other creative ways to tell the same story so that it doesn't, the novelty doesn't wear off, I suppose. Um, I think what I'm thinking of in like a live performance, my question actually was, how do you tell if the novelty's worn off? If someone's had an experience and it has made an imprint, it's a different experience. It's not the same experience, but I wouldn't necessarily say that experience is completely gone um, into the ether. Um, but yeah, I think it's really interesting because we talk about people having short attention spans, for example. So what does, what does that mean? Does that mean we sort of all just scroll and that's it and the novelty is sort of gone? Um, but yeah, I don't have an answer for that. I don't... There's part of me that says the novelty doesn't wear off, but there's a part of me that says we see so much now, it's much easier for that novelty to, to wear off. But from what James was saying also is there's always going to be someone else. So it's, there is that appealing to the same person over and over again. But also by doing that, you're going to bring in, I don't know, five, ten other people or bring in a cat into the whole situation. And you've got 100,000 people, apparently. But um, yeah, so I think it's still an open question. I mean. Just like one more thing about novelty. I, I worked on a research project, sort of audience research, with um, Astrid Briel and Coney this year. And one of the things that um, Tassos from Coney kept bringing up is that if you go, like if they, they studied young people going to theatres who hadn't been before, and it was about five times they had to go before, it, before their responses afterwards were to do with what they saw the story, the characters, as opposed to the experience of being in the theatre, what was expected of everyone in the theatre, and kind of like dealing with the experience was kind of uppermost in terms of what they talked about for the first five times. So if you want people kind of engaging with the story, um, you kind of want the novelty to wear off if you're delivering something through unfamiliar technology or with a, an unfamiliar experimental audience relationship, um, it, it maybe goes smoother if more of your audience are, are comfortable with what you're doing. So yeah, that sort of novelty for an artist, like I'm, I'm very guilty of this, just like hopping from medium to medium wherever I'm having the most fun, but like <laughs> to, to really like perfect what you can do inside um, inside one particular medium um, is going to bring you to that sort of return to story and content once people are used to the novelty of the medium. Think about a stand-up comedian versus TikTok. So a stand-up comedian, I'll go and see uh, Stuart Lee every time he plays anywhere. And, uh, and I'm very sad to know that he does the same act every night and he tweaks it a tiny bit for the audience. For him, the novelty's worn off a long time ago, but for everyone who comes, the show feels like it's just for them and he's managing the room and everything about it is, uh, is for that moment, but it's the same. So in fact, what a great stand-up comedian will do is they'll make the thing feel new, first of all. But TikTok, it's funny talking about scrolling, TikTok will just give you more of exactly what you've seen. And the whole algorithm, it's designed to feed familiarity, which is why you can't remember anything you've looked at when you're on it. You just scroll a bunch and then you sort of wander, it's like just chewing gum. Yeah, so I think that, that's an interesting analogy where you, you you just think that it's it's designed not to be memorable, <coughs> not to create novelty, just to, just a small dopamine hit with familiarity. Hmm. Yo, that's mad. He said TikTok's like chewing gum. I <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna tell my sister you said that. <laughs> also, I'm sorry if anyone here is massive on TikTok. Um, <laughs> it's great. Um, yeah, man, some like some proper insightful reflections there as well, and, and that uh, sort of like dance between novelty and story, actually, and the story of the experience itself, the story that you're sort of telling the audience, the story that the audience is seeing, and how all of those actually affect whether or not the thing is sort of like new or not. I'm, I just want to ask you a, bit, sort of a random question, a bit off-piste, isn't it, but like, when was... 
Can you remember the last time you went to the cinema twice for the same film? No, I'm mad, didn't it? What about, what about Netflix? Can you remember, like, have you ever like, just been like, I'm going to watch that again like, on Netflix? I yeah. really struggle yeah. to watch things twice. I don't know why. I feel like I'm wasting my time, slash, I've seen it already. But yeah, you know how you get some people that have seen the same film like 10 times? I can't even fathom what that's like. But everyone's really different, right? So I'm on to the next thing. I've already seen that. But then I suppose everyone's really different in that sense. Um, I might want something that's familiar. I might want something that's new or explore something at all times. And I think exploration is probably a word we should mm. bring into the mix a little bit. Mm, mm, mm. So, I mean, you, like, you were going to say that you've watched the, you've been cinema twice for a film, right? Less so now because of time, but I was the kind of teenager that lived in the cinema, and okay. so I saw my favorite films. Like I think last, like when I stopped counting, it was maybe like eighteen times. Ooh. But that was in Bulgaria, and cinemas were very affordable. Yeah. At that time. I am mad. <laughs> Definitely uh, guilty of that. Oh, terrible thing to confess about going to see a film twice. Uh, so it's the most recent Mission Possible film. It's very exciting, and they spent a lot of money on it. Uh, I had an Odin limitless card, and I had fifteen minutes to kill in town before I met someone. So I just, I'd already seen it. I went to watch the first 15 minutes. <laughs> and, and Tom Cruise is jumping out of the back of an aeroplane and I just get up and walk out. <laughs> and, and I want to believe there are still people going, and then he just got up and walked out. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what he was expecting. <laughs> um, it's, like, it's the most exciting moment that's ever been put on celluloid. And I'm going, yeah, not only for me. But uh, that's my confession. <laughs> I, I love that. Um, uh, amazing, amazing. We're, we're going to move on. Um, oh. Sorry, are you guys speaking Do you know what? Why not, man? Why not? Um, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I just like that it feels like there's a difference between novelty and comfort here. And is novelty always a good thing? I guess is the question. Sorry. That's something that I w just wanted to mention earlier when, um, yeah, it's just kind of into that. It's basically like, yeah, that kind of novelty seeking is maybe not something we should necessarily be doing. And something, when I was doing my research, which is we streamed the theater play to people um, in their homes, and it was the kind of theater that not everyone maybe is used to. It was quite experimental. Some of it was just soundscapes. And as part of the study, we asked people to really pay attention and to stay in it. And it was completely informal, but afterwards people just wrote messages and they said how how great that was. So there was something about that intentionality. It's not something they would do themselves, and that's exactly what they commented, because we kind of almost forced them into a sort of systematic, uh, cinematic sorry, experience, which was, please watch this in full screen, put your phone away. And yeah, I got the feedback of like how nice that actually felt to people. And maybe there's something to be said about the kind of intentionality and setting expectations that maybe, yeah, that's something you've seen before, but there's something to, doing something again which would now be quite novelty and interest. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think um, people... Oh, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, so the, the, if, you, if there is something that's totally novel and that people maybe aren't comfortable with, it, it's just um, to get people to enjoy it, there's a sort of more of a process, <coughs> like onboarding, um, and then, yeah, just so that people arrive at the story, kind of if, if the audience is cast as something or if they, you know, so that they know what, what, if any, role they're playing. You know, am I watching? Am I supposed to be interacting? In what way? How can I say no? How can I adapt this? So the more complicated and novel and maybe uncomfortable, unfamiliar that is, like, the more time you have to spend with people so you kind of have to offer a, a payoff. It's going to be really worth it if you sit through all of these instructions of what, like, what we need from you and what your options are. It's, it's going to be really worth the time you spent on getting fully informed on this new experience. So that's kind of a balancing act when it comes to kind of offering novel experiences to audiences. Do you remember about a decade ago when Scandi Noir became really fashionable on telly? And suddenly everyone was watching it. Everyone was saying how great it was. 
the dramas weren't necessarily better, but there was something very particular about them uh, that made them better. Uh, I mentioned this, I think, uh, during our Amplify Publishing thing. It's that you had to watch them because they had subtitles, and you couldn't look at your phone. Uh, and, uh, and if you watch most telly, you can sort of be half in and half out. But you had to really watch the Scandinavian noir. And, um, and because of that, I think that's the reason why it resonates so well with people. So to Anna's work about, uh, about that sense of flow or immersion, I, I believe strongly that you know, if you can create uh, some discomfort with it, such as you have to put your phone down and look at the subtitles, I think that can actually, cr that novelty can create immersion. You've like um, completely nailed the whole dubbed versus subbed argument, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's dope. I, I had I didn't realize that was what I was doing. <laughs> um, I uh, yeah, but not, yeah, actually. I'm finding it really interesting. Um, just hearing your responses, but I'm also wondering about just from all of your responses so far that there seems to be a lot of hierarchies of novelty and it's not just one thing. And so um, it could be like the novelty of the actual story and content of itself or the medium. And with the uh, comedian mastering his craft, the novelty has not worn off because he's, he's it's novel for him to experience that journey. Um, masters, mastery is not a, a linear sort of journey. And how could, um, like, ha thinking of novelty in like a kind of deeper way, how could you maybe think of how, what happens when it fully wears off for all hierarchies or in all its novel capacity, all dimensions? You're right, I've been thinking of novelty in terms of like a new narrative structure that people aren't familiar with or um, a new technology. Um, yeah. Uh, I love your reference about mastery. And I think uh, that's, uh, that's the thing that drives great satisfaction. Uh, I work in gaming mostly. And, uh, and gaming will always sort of level up and you'll think you're near the end and it will introduce some new elements and make it harder again. And I think that the, uh, the work in game design is a good example of you know, rigged mastery. You know, just enough to feel you've got the hang of it, but just enough to keep you pushing. Some deep stuff, Mo. Is it not human nature, though, the way that you said it, and always looking forward to the next thing and the next thing, and I've done this, I've seen this story, what's, what's new? Sorry, as you were saying that, I thought, is that not who we are to a certain extent, it's what's next, what's the new thing? And I think when I thought of novelty, I thought of it as an experience. And if I had to do that same experience five, six times, the imprint is there, but I don't feel I don't get that dopamine hit if that's what, what it is. Um, just an open question, I have loads of questions <laughs> and no answers. Um, that repetition thing, I'm curious. Mm. There are academics in the room and um, you give the same lecture sometimes. Uh, over a period of time. And uh, is the lecture better because it's delivered fresh? Uh, or is it the same, it could have been recorded? You know, I understand uh, the stand-up comedian owning the room, but uh, where there's repetition, does it add value or is it, is it just degrading the fashion? Does any academic want to own up to that question? Yeah, go on then. Um, whilst you're doing that, can I answer that? Like, um, yeah, I guess what came up for me is reading the same book over and over again. Um, so I'm practicing Buddhist, for example, and I can read the same chapter, but next week it's going to hit really different. And after that, it's sort of like when my mum tells me the same thing over and over again, and that one day I'm like, oh, I get it now. And actually I wonder by saying this whole novelty thing, do we miss something? Because we're sort of looking forward. I'm wondering there's still quite a lot of learning or a lot of experiences within that same thing. You just need different circumstances and like a different environment in order for you to receive it um, in a different way. So then 
that same no one experience is ever actually the same experience comes up. I, um, I, I like talking about the same thing over and over again. <laughs> um, because it feels like you kind of, you always discover like something new in there. So it's like, it's like kind of endlessly learning, I think. It, I mean, so, but also I think it's also important to think about boredom as an experience. Like, um, so, like, if we're talking about novelty wearing off, then maybe the experience is kind of boredom and actually maybe it's all right, that experience. So, like, and then I was thinking that I make, like, um, paintings. I'm static, you know, like, oh, well, actually, my mood, but... But, and that actually, you need to sometimes go back and back and back and back and back to those things because the layers need to kind of come off and you need to, like you said, you know, experience what the gallery is or, like, what the floor feels like under your feet or the day is different or the light is different or the... So, in a sense, that's really kind of important to maybe even be bored in front of it um, because it's a different experience. Is it like Matisse's Water Lilies? <laughs> where he does them again and again, the same, same yeah. position in the bridge? Yeah, yeah like, um, went to that um, immersive Van Gogh experience. I was at the prop yard and learned that he'd, like, painted some of his paintings, like, three or four times. And I was like, oh, that's, that's mad. Like, you can go to a Van Gogh, like, exhibition in different parts of the world, potentially, and recognize the same painting, but be looking at a different one. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, yeah, sorry, I was about to go on another tangent about fakes, but let's not do that. <laughs> All right, cool. We're handing back over to the audience. We are, I cheated, and I was testing it, and I answered that one, so ignore that. Um, yeah, please, cast your votes. What question would you like our esteemed panelists? And yeah, man, I'm not, I'm just soft. I'm so sorry, like, they're gonna be turning around and looking at stuff. You think they've settled on something and they keep surprising you. Sick. So it seems like we've landed some somewhere. <laughs> and the drawer again. Um, <coughs> okay. Yeah, that it's that first one, isn't it? I do really like the second one though. But let's go, let's go with the first one. Oh Lord. Alright, sick. How important is the audience at the genesis of an idea? I'm I'm gonna throw that one at you, James, because you, you mentioned that in, in your first answer about when you were talking about novelty wearing off for the creator um, and like the reference to comedy as well? Uh, I can't speak to the um, uh, uh, an artistic experience uh, in the, uh, with the same expertise I can to journalism. Uh, we're mostly uh, uh, websites and we're obsessed with search. So our start point for making content is what are people looking for? And we can hold a mirror up to the audiences and make that. And the argument internally in the company is, if you're making a piece of content that doesn't have an audience baked in, like they're not Googling that phrase, or then, um, then there's no point. And it's a bit grim and a bit reductive and not as artistic as you want, but, um, but you're giving people uh, in utility and you're responding to their intent. So I think, and, and that doesn't <coughs> always have to be 
boring things, they might be asking exciting things, uh, but I think for that, the audience is absolutely at the center of, of uh, creating media for the web. And I think, and that's words, but if you're making content for YouTube, understanding the tagging system, and understanding what content will be found, again, it just extends into that on how search works there. So I would, I'd say uh, the audience, now we'd have to make assumptions about the audience, um, about, uh, and that sort of matches inclusivity uh, agenda we want to carry, which is, you know, we don't have to, we'd have to know anything about uh, uh, their orientation, whether they're people of color, anything about them. We just have to know what they're into, and that's enough. And for us, they're all gamers, for example. And they all like playing this video game, or they like these anime films, and that's all we need to know. Yeah, you, you got me thinking, because you mentioned that it's like so specific to web, digital, and, and gaming as well. You got me thinking a little bit more, again, about sort of like your research, Anna, in that. Um, like uh, one of my friends is making an album at the minute, and he is he's very much pouring his current lived experience into that album. And what we're finding as a group of friends around him is that this is the purest music he's ever made. Um, it seems quite effortless, and all of the sound is really clean, and the content is really getting across, but like you can't measure that, I, I guess. So I'm, I'm interested in, in sort of how your, your like creativity or your careers or your thinking around sort of audiences, how that idea of the stuff you can't measure <laughs> comes into your work. Um, that's, that's open for anyone. Thank you. Can I go? Yeah. I was actually thinking um, someone who works in comms and you have to do loads of evaluation and surveys, like the stuff that we work in is unquantifiable, actually. I think how do you measure if your work has had an impact on someone? Um, what's the dwell time? Is a second enough? Actually, I've walked through sort of outdoor spaces and I feel touched, but I've got to keep it moving. I've got work, but it doesn't mean I haven't experience that actually and I think so just going off of unquantifiable I think this year more than ever I just realized there's so many things that we do especially in the arts and culture that you can't measure um, and how do you sort of do that how walk home having self-reflection how do you measure that something that you then sort of adopt for it to be something you want to actually look into and do more of like how do you measure that um, so I think let's just ban all the surveys and all the, and all the criteria that you have to tick. Actually, I think there's a massive part of it in which everyone's looking at the numbers and not how we've all felt about it. And we can't measure it, and it's very subjective, actually. Um, but yeah. Art and invention are different things, aren't they, mm. uh, to uh, focus groups. It was uh, Henry Ford who was asked uh, before he rented the car if he'd done a survey, if people would have said they wanted a faster horse. So, because we didn't know, we couldn't imagine that thing. So, you know, you can serve an existing audience or the job of art and culture is to, to push invention. And that's a really hard thing to, to, to figure mm. out. It and I, space think, to um, I also think, so going back to what you were saying, I thought it was really interesting because I think if we, I do sit on both, I think we should think about the audiences, but I also wonder where the innovation is. If we're going into Google to see what everyone's searching, how do we find the thing that we didn't know we needed, but we actually really did know that we need? Um, but I also equally think that if you think of your audience, um, start with your audience, audience at the start, then you've got an idea of who they are, what story they want to actually tell, um, how to tell that story, because I think sometimes people can come into the space and say, this is what I think the audience want, but actually the audience that you think is your audience, probably have had that for the longest time ever. It's like trauma or doom or something that we have currently going on. And I think what that perpetuates is the same thing over and over again. And we don't have anything that's new. So I'm learning that I think I'm just a new person, everything new, new, new right now. I've got loads of thoughts right now. Um, so when I do, I, I do sort of two kinds of performance and, um, or when I was doing a lot more in-person stuff, kind of uh, what reminded me of your, your friend's album 
is is what I learned doing sort of solo improv um, at the wardrobe theatre with um, Beyond the Ridiculous, that the kind of the stuff inside you as a creator can feel very personal and like it's too specific to you but actually like often it's the details and it's those like very specific details that make other people hearing your story able to connect with it like sensory information or like just something where they can imagine their their body and mind in that situation so there's that sort of intimacy and vulnerability of it but then the the kind of more knockabout um, interactive stuff I do for for big audiences at festivals, um, I would tend to frame that as you're coming into a shop and this is the game in here and kind of so people go in with this like knowledge of what you do in a shop and then it's it's up to our sort of crew of performers to kind of skew that or twist it or make it funny, make it an adventure. Um, like a shop or a university or a police station. I've done all of those in different different shows. Um, so yeah, there's something about sort of the general and the known and the specific and interior that, yeah, kind of need both, yes. Layers, man. I love how this conversation is like right on the edge between sort of like the panel, like the conversation we're having, but also some really deep existential stuff. <laughs> we keep going like, ooh, not now. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is incredible. What do do like James and Anna? Do you, do you have any thoughts on on what we've spoken about? The existential stuff, or <laughs> no? I think to that question. I mean, I'm not an artist, and it's fascinating to to listen to artists and and what the process is. Um, but I, I I have been thinking about ideas and where they come from, and generally, I think it's a quite a fascinating thing. And I just wanted to share this, which is probably a little bit of a tangent. But um, one of the sort of OG philosophers of science, Karl Popper, he has this really interesting view on ideas, and he sees them almost as this otherworldly thing that don't belong to the people whose brain generates them at the time, but they're just this like weird accumulation of information. And he almost says like, they live in this, he calls it world three, um, and they just, they just reside there. So it's like, yeah. Uh, one of the things about uh, artists is they don't have to be marketeers. And it's a different discipline. And that's why, uh, now, uh, no, no, uh, no, the point is, um, uh, an artist will think they have to learn everything about helping their work reach audiences. And there are people uh, like me who are terrible artists, but know about distribution. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think uh, the tip really is artists should make friends with uh, and, and work with collaborators that have the other disciplines, because you know, I, can't, I can't do plumbing, uh, and I wouldn't think I could. Whereas an artist might think they can understand distribution and marketing because they are bright people and creative, but these are, these are different things. So I think when we talk about audience at the genesis of the idea, you know, it's, it's the artist's job to tell the truth and make great art, but it won't always be part of the science of audience and distribution, and they should just get help. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little, bit, a little bit of creative entrepreneurialism 101 right there for everybody as well. Um, I'm conscious of time, but I'm also interested to know if the audience in the room have any questions as well. Nah, you're lying. <laughs> Only for the second one. I see. I see a tentative. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, John. Yes, yeah, so it's more of a comment on your last point than a question, really. Um, so uh, I think there are many different kinds of artists, and some of them need collaborators who can help them distribute their ideas, and some of them, it's part of their art form. Uh, so, yeah, and then on that sort of diversity, um, as well, what nobody's mentioned in, in this discussion is that we've got so many different types of viewing spaces and viewing situations, so our, uh, 
in terms of how audiences receive things, they might receive them differently when viewing in, in solitude as to uh, viewing in social situations. So a piece of, a piece of art or a piece of theatre or a piece of film might be consumed differently depending on, depending on how it's viewed and um, how people are viewing it. Um, I always think that it's probably a good idea to understand the audiences that might come and see your work, even if you're not creating something for them. So I think there's, you know, in order to improve inclusion and diversity, we need to understand other people better. Um, so those are just some observations, but um, thank you for an, a really fascinating discussion. Thank you. Um, yeah, man, like you lot got me thinking real long and hard about whatever creative thing I do. Uh, yeah, because it could be anything at this moment in time. All right, cool, we got one more question, although I do like question two as well. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you guys the next set of questions and then let you decide whether or not they're more interesting than question two. <laughs> All right, we should be going live soon. God willing. There we go. Oh, oh yeah, they're good questions, boy. Sorry. You think question two is better? Huh? <laughs> I'm so happy I'm not answering these. <laughs> oh, thanks for saying I just, that. I just, right? I just got that feeling of like, oh my lord, what would I? <laughs> you lot were so nice to me when you responded to the, these are great questions, Prince. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. This is turning into a panto, isn't it? <laughs> you got me. I love a good pun. <laughs> okay. 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 We got. We got like yeah, a few minutes left. So I'm gonna jump in here and ask the panelists. At what point does immersion become co-creation? Mm. Um, they're they actually been doing a um, research project that kind of looks at all of these categories. People really um, confuse um, and don't quite know how to define either immersive or participatory what what those things mean um, and because there's not really a, like a consistent definition across you know even the small um, audience focus groups that that we had um, people really disagreed about the, the difference between those things so one of the things we did with that research project is the playing audiences guide so it's supposed to kind of offer a way for people going into something that's immersive or participatory to understand like the different kinds of immersion and participation that are going to be and, and co-creation to I would say like in in the way we categorized it that would be kind of a step further that you're if you don't participate it's it's kind of more at a at a detriment to other people's experience or to to kind of the construction of the whole thing. Um, yeah, defining terms is hard, um, but um, yeah, my mind my mind's sort of spinning right now. But but yeah, the um, being very specific about. If you're immersed, what are you immersed 
in. Um, and if you're participating, what kind of level of, you know, how, how can you calibrate that for yourself um, and, and kind of how, how is your consent kind of sought for different kinds of participation and co-creation and, you know, if it's performance, like how do the performers know if, if you're really hating it? Um, are, are you going to feel sort of embarrassed? Um, so that's kind of what our, what our research project was about. It's like we looked at reluctant participants, people who really hate participatory work, we interviewed them and kind of that the feeling you can get when you're being asked to co-create something by surprise or something you don't feel up to or something where you feel like the production is kind of might be tricking you into making you a fool of yourself like the the people who are afraid of that happening the fear is like really intense and also comes along with a lot of um a, like internal monologue about like not being good enough to experience the work, which um, I so he makes a lot of immersive participatory stuff that was like, oh, I wonder how often I've I've done that to people, <laughs> um, thinking I'm just being a sort of jolly holiday camp performer. Um, so yeah, in terms of that line between immersion and co-creation, like people, I think what that brings up for me is people need to know how necessary their contribution is going to be and how involved the participation is going to be and what it adds to or takes away from other people's experiences as well. Because if it's just for yourself, you know, if you feel like you're not doing a great job immersing yourself in something, that's not so hard as feeling like you're ruining it for everybody else. Have you got time? I've got three answers to this. Uh, first of all, if you want the best definition of uh, co-creation, read Cialdini's book, Inf uh, Persuasion. It's really good. Uh, uh, the second thing is uh, co-creation is massive in games. You know, people, yeah. people online building Minecraft buildings together. Yeah. And uh, you have dozens of people on a server building things. So it's a really big area. But I'm going to talk about co-creation really self-indulgently for about a minute. Uh, and I'm glad that you mentioned Judge Dredd because it's a callback on 2000 AD. So I grew up reading comics a lot. And... Uh, and no, I, I will, sorry. Uh, so I grew up reading comics a lot. And uh, my favourite comic artist died last week. His name is Kevin O'Neill. And he was just this amazing illustrator. And uh, in 1981, my parents took me to a comic event in London. And I met him when I was 11. And he drew me a picture. And it was a fabulous picture of uh, one of the characters from the comic. Uh, I got home to the hotel I was staying in. And I drew on the back of it. And I drew around the sides of it because I was so excited that I'd met this artist. Uh, uh, my mum was furious with me because I'd ruined the artefact. Uh, and, uh, and as a teenager, later on, I felt shame that I'd ruined the artefact. He died last week, and I found the picture out. And it made me so happy that I'd ruined the artefact because I had the thing that was a picture by the artist that I loved, but I had my perspective on it as an 11-year-old boy. And it absolutely delighted me to see that I had defaced and ruined the thing that you could sell. Uh, but it, it, it actually meant something because uh, I had engaged in co-creation with an artist that I loved. Uh, that's my answer for that. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, what a note. That's my TED talk. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, thank you to the four of you for just being absolute stars, man. And I've really enjoyed sort of learning from you guys. Um, and thank you to our audience in the room um, and the audience at home. And to the team that's put this whole thing together, man, it's been absolutely wild. If I've got one takeaway from it, it's like we're sat here and looking, I look at people in the room and I think, y'all are smart. You lot all know so much. But I know from my questions that you don't know much either. So that's, <laughs> that's fun, man. Keep up the good work, man. And really, 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 really appreciate being able to share this moment with you all as well. Joe, do I hand back over to you? Come on. Thank you for it. Thanks for having me. Thank you to you, Prince. I've got a few things to say, so do you guys want to take a more comfortable seat? Um, ooh. 
Thank you, everyone. We are very nearly done. Um, I'm going to say a few things about today, and then I'm going to invite my partner in research crime to say um, a couple of things about what comes next for Bristol and Bath Creative R&D. Um, and then I'm going to tell us how to leave and where we might go um, after here. So firstly, just thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of the speakers for today, the artists, the makers, um, and most of all to all of you, I guess. Not most of all. Let's all together <laughs> thank each other. Um, I have, there has been so much conversation um, in here and in all, across all the rooms today. I've really enjoyed being a part of it and, and listening to you all. Um, thank you, of course, for the teams that worked slavishly hard to get today together. Um, that's hugely appreciated to Swans, to Watershed Events team and tech team, to Bath Spa um, and to everyone else who has been involved. Um, I, I'm just going to finish off by reading a quote um, from Ian Bogost, who wrote a, play, a book called Play Anything, um, that I found really useful when thinking about the programme for today and yesterday. Um, and I think it's really useful for thinking about the future of creative technology in our cities too. So I'm going to leave it with you. First, play cl close, foolish, even absurd attention to things. Then allow their structure, form and nature to set the limits for the experiences you derive from them. By refusing to ask what could be different and instead allowing what is present to guide us, we create a new space, a magic circle, a circumscribed imaginary playground in which the limitations of the things we encounter, of anything we encounter, can produce meaningful experiences. Well, is your brain hurting after all that? It's been a long day, hasn't it? It's been a very long day, and I feel quite exhausted, and I feel like going, woo! Do you feel like going, woo! It's been great. It's been amazing. And, and I want to say, this is not the end of the Bristol and Bath Creative R&D program. It is just the beginning of the end. What you've experienced today and yesterday, I hope, gives you a sense of what the deep and rich mix of creativity, art, technology and critique is that we've been trying to develop in this city over quite a long time. And I think that hopefully when we get another few months, we'll be able to try and sit down and work out all the things that we've been doing and put them into a report and some future publications and some policy do documents and go out and lobby for the next lot of stuff and how to keep our world moving and how to keep it developing. Uh, and so look out for that because in the spring there'll be a Bristol and Bath Creative R&D report. It'll be public facing, be on our website. And it'll try and pull together all the learning that we have that we can share with you that will help us to be able to go on to do this again and again and again in the future. But quite apart from a bloody report, who needs another bloody report in the world? Really? We have to do that. We have to do that for everybody, for our funders too. But who needs that? What you really need is the relationships that you all form through the things that we do together. What the true legacy of a project like this is are relationships. It's the relationships between people who are creative, who have great ideas, relationships between those people and the money, the institutions, and the relationships between those people and the technology and the city. So it's all about building a network of relationships. That's what we do, and that's you. So thanks for being our product, because it's a network of relationships, it's people, and it's the relationships that you make with each other. Every day on this project, I hear stories about, oh, so-and-so connected with so-and-so, I had no idea that was happening. Ian, and, and Ian Gilchrist and Dan, I told me, to, told me yesterday, I never knew. Their labs from two different universities have kind of basically fused in the last two years, and that there's a whole new thing happening there that wouldn't have been happening if we hadn't had this structure for people to meet and work together. So it's about networks and it's about relationships, so carry on doing that. 
I've also wanted to do some thanking, mostly to the crew that have got this together for the last two days. People have been working really, really hard behind the scenes, and I can't thank you enough. All of the crew that have volunteered, people that have stepped in, you've all been amazing. The tech crew, you and thanks to Watershed, thanks to Bass Bar Tech, thanks to Swans Events. It's all been really, really, really beautifully put together. And I personally have had such a great day. I've seen so much great work today because I didn't see a lot of the work, especially the performance stuff that happened in lockdown. I never really saw a lot of it because it was all at a distance and somewhere else. So I hope you've had half as good a day as I have. And this will be the last big project that I run in my working life, and I can't tell you how proud I am of you and of my team and of the work that we're making and of the future that we're creating. There will be more things in Bristol and Bath. My world's already happening. There are even bigger plans coming up in the future, so hopefully we can carry on showing that art and technology and change are the things that we want to do in the world together. Yeah, that's me. And we need to say something about what, what happens next. There is a green bomber jacket with some keys in the pocket that has been left in W1. It is now sitting at box office. Paul Clark, please collect it on your way out. <laughs> um, if you are still wearing a lanyard, please don't take it with you. Please also leave it on the box office table. Um, if you have a ticket for um, the evening performance um, over at Arnolfini, um, that is Circle by Squid Soup and Roxana Vilk, who some of you did um, an amazing workshop with earlier on today, we will be making our way over the bridge to Arnolfini for 6.30. Um, if you don't have a ticket, I suggest try your luck, but it's up to you. Um, I imagine there'll be some drinks in the bar um, also for people that aren't going to the performance. I think that's all I've got to say. Yeah, okay, thanks very much. Thank